Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome again to Combit Hour. Emily here, Zila for stage and um, we'll be welcoming the Be Young for today's session, for today's exchange, intergenerational exchange around arts and art making. So because it is a very impressive bio and for those of you who do not really know to be so to be young Anita Africa is a queer non-binary African Haimakan and Tokarantronian dub poet monodramatist and black feminist decolonial scholar they are committed to embodying liberatory art practices that ritualize acts of emancipation from oppressions inflicted upon the people and the planet the three-time Dora Award-winning Canadian poet of honor, author of 12 plays, seven albums, and four collections of poetry, was recently celebrated as a global leader in theater and performance by Arts Council England and is the 2021 recipient of the Rosemary Sadlier Freedom Award. The B's PhD, research investigates how black women theater makers in Canada cultivate decolonial praxis and pedagogies of transformation through performance. Their doctoral thesis further develops the Anitafrica method, a black queer feminist framework that emerges out of the dub theory of Anita Stewart, the B. Young's mother. And there's more. So throughout the last 25 years, Debbie has written poetry, created plays, published works, published books, developed a decolonial framework, and founded Black Queer Feminist Initiative, such as the Fiwi Art Space, Anit Africa Dub Theater, Spolusi Press, Wata Theater and Ubuntu Decolonial Arts Center. And that is definitely something I'm going to ask her about today, so stay tuned. Their commitment to designing and facilitating decolonial artist mentorship opportunities has facilitated the growth and development of hundreds of artists on Turtle Island, in the Caribbean, in Africa, and in Europe. Current projects include Firstly, publishing dub poetry to Dubbin Theater, the collected, ri collected writings of Anita Stewart, and Dubbin Theater, the collected plays of the B. Young Anita Africa. Second project is establishing Ubuntu Decolonial Arts Center in Costa Rica, where international practitioners participate in artist residencies using the Anit Africa method and the third project, writing the first monograph on black women's theater in Canada. Most recently, the B. Young appeared in Trey Anthony's The Kink in My Hair to sold out audiences at the Bluma Appel Theater. I can't, I'm never sure if it's, yeah, Appel, Bluma Appel Theater in Toronto. They, rep they reprise their roles as Stacey Ann and Claudette and introduce two new roles as Afrika and Fitzroy. <laughs> yes, Feline. So, um, yes, so this is, this is part, part of why I was just so excited and honored, right, that um, to be was available with their busy, busy schedule. Good afternoon. Or is it the morning for you, Debbie? It is 11-ish. Okay. <laughs> so it's the, it's the morning. Nice. It's so nice to have you, Debbie. I was just... So I read your, um, your bio. Um, so I was wondering if you'd like to present yourself or say uh, how you would uh, like what you would like to share with us this morning or if you wanted me to reread the first part of your bio oh no no need to reread it i just want to say a big shout out to the global village 
and a big shout out to you for inviting me to this space and for for creating this space where these conversations can happen because they're really urgent and I'm excited to dive in. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Tabi. Um, Jasper J says, love you both. Thank you, Jazz, so much for joining us. We have a few people joining us today. Um, I was just mentioning, so Feline is here, and I was just telling Feline how we met through your online program. Yeah. I think it was like spring of 2020. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So thank you again. Um, and I guess we'll just jump right in. You know, there's so much I want to ask you, so I just want to give you as much time as possible. So can you tell us about your work, about your practice, how you define it, you know, what you would like to share about it? Yeah, I am a dub poet, uh, which is a specific genre of poetry that emerges out of Jamaica. I am also a playwright, and I specifically write one-person shows that are biomyth monodramas. So they're catalyzed by biographical experiences, and then further developed, <clears throat> further developed into um, mythology, make-believe mm -hmm. ways in which I can empower myself through characters who make different choices in their life. Uh, I am also an educator and I grew up in a community in Jamaica raised by my mom, Anita Stewart, a community that practiced decolonial popular education through theater and poetry. So that is It feels like my air that I breathe. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it feels like the water that I drink. Mm -hmm. And so poetry, playmaking, and education are really the three areas that are one area <laughs> that I offer to the global village and that I offer to myself and since I've been working on the PhD for the last four years it's really helped me to clarify some language around what it is that I do mm -hmm. and so intersectional comes to mind intersectionality being that black woman carved out space of acknowledging that all of our identities compound and intersect to impact the way in which we experience our lives. So race, class, gender, sexuality, ability, or, or location on the planet, Mm -hmm. of the languages we speak, that all of this is working together within a society that is still experiencing the impact of colonization, colonialisms, colonial thinking. So intersectional is... is a fundamental part of how I approach my understanding of the world. Mm -hmm. Decolonial is also crucial. Decolonial meaning a consistent and ongoing attempt to interrupt colonial power systems and colonial dynamics that we have inherited through colonization and colonization being the system whereby European nations and uh, later North American nations such as the US and Canada moved into other people's spaces 
stole resources, stole bodies, stole cultural systems and languages, reorganized these indigenous people's ways of living and really ruptured, mm -hmm. destroyed, and in some cases, perpetuated genocide on the peoples of the land. And, and for a 500-year process, stole Black people, Black bodies from the continent and took them to other parts of the world, North America, Europe, South America, the Caribbean, to make them enslaved to produce the wealth that Europe and North America experienced then and is still experiencing now. So the wealth distribution system mm -hmm. in the world is the result of the transatlantic enslavementocracy. So decolonial is a fundamental part of the lens that I use as an artist and as an educator. And then trauma-informed. Trauma-informed, trauma-aware. And, you know, when we think of intersectionality and we think of decoloniality, we think of the systems, the, the systemic systems of oppression that exist it becomes crucial to acknowledge that oppression harms the body, mm -hmm. oppression harms the mind, oppression harms the spirit. And so moving with an awareness of, of the harm that has been done and continues to be done on Black, Indigenous, and other global majority people is is crucial for any kind of intervention that we're attempting to make in in rupturing systems of oppression so it's 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 urgent that we are trauma aware that we are trauma informed that we that we investigate and interrogate how our own bodies function through trauma and how we can heal through trauma. So intersectional, mm -hmm. decolonial, trauma-aware are the lenses that I use to inform my work as an artist and as, a, as an educator. And, and deepening that grassroots knowledge that I grew up with in Jamaica, in Canada, and in other parts of the world, deepening that has come about through the last four years of doing postgraduate work, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. And I really, really appreciate how you talk about these different elements, intersectionality, decolonialism, trauma, um, as actions like when you were describing decolonialism you were saying you know it's the consistent that you know there's an intention and it's constant interruption and i really like that because i know for myself i mean i do think of decolonialism as something to do um even as we think but then i also find that sometimes there's that element of like consistent that um you know, I mean, at times I might forget or I might think, oh, well, I take this approach. So, you know, this should work. But no, it's like that consistent questioning. <clears throat> because also, as you said, there is a consistent genocidal system that is always at play. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, for, for, for those of us who consider ourselves to be teachers, it's really important to maintain this relationship with learning and being a student, mm -hmm. right? Because if I, if I, if as an, a teacher, as an educator, as a facilitator, I move with the energy of having arrived at some sort of educational plateau or some sort of philosophical plateau or some sort of intellectual plateau, 
then how am I going to grow further? And if you think of decolonizing, if decolonizing is, a, is an action that has to be engaged with holistically, so we're, we're talking emotionally, spiritually, mm -hmm. physiologically, energetically, creatively, communally. If decolonizing has to happen at all these different levels and at, and, and at these different points on the circle, then it is impossible for me as a practitioner to arrive at some plateau of learning, you know? It, it, yeah. Then that, that, that every breath I take, every moment of my life has the potential to be an act of decolonizing. And I'm and I'm looking inward, right? If if mm -hmm. if, if if we if we're engaging with our communities outwardly, sharing what it is that we are experiencing simultaneously, that outward sharing or interrogation, or that that outward visiting, has to also be inward. So I'm looking at how I've been socialized, how I've been conditioned mm -hmm. by colonial systems that I grew up in and that I continue to grow up in. So there is this relationship between the outward and the inward, which is very active. And, and it's not only cerebral, it has to be brought into the body because it is my body that experiences harm. It is my body that remembers the harm that it's experienced. And it is my body that I'm using to interact with the world. So, so the work has got to be brought into my body. The, the change mm -hmm. brought into my body. The way that I relate to myself as a, a melanated human being with multiple identities that's not just cerebral. It's not just intellectual. It's not just philosophical. But that, 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 that philosophy has to be brought into my body, which reminds me of African knowledge systems and African mm -hmm. philosophical systems like Ubuntu or Sankofa that, that remind us that any kind of work towards revolutionary or radical change has to be brought into the body while it is being shared with community. Mm -hmm. I am who I are, or I look back to get the knowledge. It is a consistent internal, external, internal, external relationship and, and circularity. And that, and that, those lessons, I, I feel that those lessons have existed for a very long time in, in indigenous knowledge systems. You know, they're inside of our bodies. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, as you were explaining that, I was thinking about um, my dance mentor, Pinier Guerrier. He, um, when he teaches dance, he also teaches us some of the Creole expressions or Haitian expressions. And one says "bien prépa la caille," which means you've never arrived, right? You've never you're never at a stagnant place where you just got it all, right? And when I think of that in my body, I think of how when I come to, let's say, a dance class or to a new artistic space or any situation, and I'm open to receiving, yeah. it's like I rediscover so much information. And it builds from what I already know, right? So if if we do if if we do that work of always staying open, it's like the same. What seems like the same thing keeps transforming. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. what seems the same thing keeps transforming. That's incredible. I I remember years ago when one of my teachers told me that you may think that you're learning the same thing over and over again. But if you are continuing to grow and continue to change, the same person isn't, couldn't be learning the same thing. 
exactly. You know, mm-hmm. that, that every stage of exchange with the world, with the texture of your life, something is changing, you know? And even if that's measurable, it is changing. And so sometimes I, I feel to myself, I've been here before, but actually not. not. Mm-hmm. Actually not. And if it's similar to something that I've experienced in the past, uh, the moment is presenting me with an opportunity to learn something additional or to learn it from a different perspective mm-hmm. or to deepen the learning so that the body remembers, so that new neural pathways are created in the brain, so that I know that I have multiple options as opposed to find window of options, which which trauma which trauma does, you know, trauma trauma changes the brain mm-hmm. and gives the illusion that we have less options. Mm-hmm than infinite possibilities. And now, you know, when I hear a statement like that, I also think about the way that systemic oppression, (laughs) the way that racism and sexism and classism, these systems that would necessarily prevent one from living to their fullest potential can also contribute to me believing that I have less options in the world. And so the work, a, a part of the work for me is to, while acknowledging systemic oppression and, and engaging in rupturing systemic oppression, while acknowledging that my body has experienced generational traumas and interpersonal traumas, while acknowledging and engaging those truths, I'm also creating a space within my body for infinite possibilities. I'm also creating a space in my body for dreaming. I'm also mm-hmm. creating a space in my body for imagining and visioning emancipation that this kind of engagement with what is possible is crucial while I'm dealing with systemic oppression, while I'm dealing with the impacts of trauma, I still have to dream. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that was, uh, I love those moments of listening to you when just all that comes, like all that richness. Whew, yeah. Um, yeah, and, it, it, and it, the image that came to mind is you on stage, honestly. Because I was, I did see the the kink in my hair. This last that you were, yes, this last one I did see it, <laughs> and it was fabulous how you just embodied, as you said, so many possibilities, you know, and so many possibilities. Knowing and and me as an audience member also knowing that you had so many different traumas in your bodies and how you could transcend that and tell these stories and almost provide like you know this is what it can look like on the other side. Um, yeah, like your performance, your being is phenomenal. Really, really phenomenal. That, that- I, that experience was transformational. I I hmm. I'm still I'm still processing the depth of joy that that experience brought to my body. Hmm. I I still. And it, and it's it's a it's it's many things, right? It's many things. It is, it is the the communal space of safety and collectivism that was co-created by all the members of the team, led by our director Wayne Mengesha. Mm. That that first thing. The 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 what what was happening in the background 
was the practice of what we shared in the foreground. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the first thing. Going into rehearsals day and being in circle with these human beings. So there was that. There was, and then and then the process of remounting a production 20 years later and mm -hmm. and witnessing the growth of 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 the, the the folks who had been there from that time witnessing our growth and then witnessing the growth of the new collective members mm -hmm. that was another piece of magic then being supported by a design team and a production team from Soul Pepper, from Bluma Appel, from Teo Live. Like having people have your back mm. throughout the production process was thing. Then rehearsing, bringing the piece all together, bringing training and words and her vision together led by Wayne and having each actor step into their phenomenalness and, and then having an audience of people who are open to going on a journey that was that was not easy mm -hmm. and having that audience hold us and us holding the audience and then finally for me having the opportunity on some nights to go out upstairs at the bluma and be in in really close proximity with members of the audience like all of that together produced for me the dream of what I imagined when I was a child watching my mother on stage. What I imagined that storytelling could feel like. Mm. This, mm. this latest incarnation of the kink epitomized for me my dream as a performer. I mean, it... it, it I can say that with all its enormity and all its expansiveness, that 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 that's where I want to be. That's mm. that storytelling for me. That's who I want to be. I want to be that storyteller, <laughs> and and I am. You are. I, I was about to say you are that storyteller. And I am. Yes. So it's like, yeah. you know, to just to just when the king finished i went i went into a period of silence because i needed to i needed to allow my body to spiritually experience that moment and so i went into a period of silence brought brought the new year in in silence and i feel like it's now april 1st it's now we are in spring it's another new year. We get to begin again. And I know that the energy of the year thus far is being carried by that experience in, in December. Mm -hmm. That, that, mm -hmm. that expe experience of true community engagement, healing, love, has set the tone for this period that I'm now in. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that you said you gave space to, I almost heard you say you gave space to your spirit, but you said you gave space to yourself to experience that spiritually. And, and that comes to, um, 
a curiosity I have about, so as a dancer, performer, artist, who also tells difficult stories, who is all about what you just said, you know, like mm -hmm. using my gifts to tell these stories, but also to bring people elsewhere, to take them to a place of healing. Yeah. Yeah. That experience of holding the audience and the audience holding you, can you tell us more about that? Uh, especially in, in terms of, uh, actually, I won't say more, yes. It, I mean, it is, it's a part of what I'm trying to write about in the PhD <laughs> because I believe that that is Black women's decolonial performance praxis. I do. I, I, and, I, and, I, and that doesn't mean that it's exclusively Black women. Right. Not saying that. But I'm speaking from that place. Mm -hmm. so I, I, I can't say that it is everyone. I believe that it is everyone. But I'm, I am making the case that in Black women's performance praxis, this relationship between the practitioner and the community is a sacred relationship in which there is infinite space for what you just described, which is the story being the medium through which a practitioner is able to hold an audience and an audience is able to hold a practitioner. And in that space of holding in the circle, healing transformation has the potential to occur. And that, that's what I experienced in the kink. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that 20 years ago, when we were doing the kink, and I started to experience that, I thought to myself, no, this is what I remember feeling watching my mom on stage, watching the dub poets in Jamaica on stage, going to the Ward Theater and watching these practitioners speak in Jamaica nation language, reflect back to me the livelihood that I was living in Jamaica, validating, acknowledging, celebrating. All of this was happening when I was watching theater growing up. And, and, and as, a, as an emerging practitioner at the beginning of the kink, I thought to myself, but this is, this is, this is, what, I, this is what I felt as a child. It sent me on a sojourn and on a rite of passage and on a journey that I'm still on. I'm still on it as a practitioner. I'm like, what is this magic that I experience from the perspective uh, of an audience member when I'm watching people like um, Saul Williams perform or I'm watching people like... Uh, uh, Naila Kalita may perform, or I'm watching people like Tracy Chapman perform, or I'm watching Motion perform, or I'm watching um, these incredible poets from Rise, this like group of young, brilliant practitioners perform, right? Like I'm experiencing it when I'm watching them perform. And then when I'm on stage, I'm experiencing it from a practitioner's perspective. And so I decided to write about that in the PhD because one, our frameworks and our approaches, our methodologies that, 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 that are inside of our bodies, that are remembered knowledges from generations before, we need to document and archive and articulate mm. the processes that are happening through these methodologies that are that are impacting not only the, the cultural and theatrical landscape of Canada, but the cultural and theatrical landscape of the entire world. Like we've seen the impact that that African knowledge systems, storytelling knowledge systems have had and continue to have on the on the on the entire planet. So I'm trying to write about this and I'm trying to articulate from a very personal place, but also in conversation with other 
black women theater practitioners across Canada, how they approach theater making and how theater making becomes this medium for metabolizing trauma, but that it, it doesn't stop there. It's a, it becomes a medium for metabolizing trauma. In my own case, writing many, many one person shows that are attempting to navigate through racism and sexism and depression and anxiety and ableism and homophobia. Like every show that I've ever written is an attempt to metabolize the traumas that I've experienced and that members of my community has experienced you know, in this life. So I'm talking to them, these Black women theater makers, about how they approach metabolizing trauma through performance. And then I'm also talking to them about how they experience emancipation and liberation through the act of performing. For me, my characters always make different choices, choices that I wasn't able to make. And every time I'm on stage and the characters make those choices i experience emancipation and liberation through them so i'm talking to these black women about how how they approach that and then i'm also looking at how black women theater makers create institutions that allow their knowledge systems to be passed on mm. right and so this is another thing you see it, as a as a as a survival and thrival tool within our communities is we create institutions looking at the way that systemic oppression uh, creates these exclusions and these erasures you know there are there are you know theater companies that don't prioritize our work and so what we do is we create our own theater companies there's a long tradition of this Adrizina Mandiela be current theater which educated so many of us, myself included. Um, theater Archipelago, Roma Spencer. The, um, theater, Black Theater Workshop in Montreal. Um, Vera Cujo's theater company that educated Audrey and, and Janet Sears, it, it, creating along with a group of, of other Black practitioners creating the African Playwrights Festival. These are institutions that are, that are birthed by us. And so mm -hmm. in, in, in doing the PhD, it's really allowed me to, again, going back to that question, it's like a really long answer because it's a really complex and dynamic process that is happening here. Going back to that question of the audience holding the practitioner and the practitioner holding the audience, when this PhD has allowed me to look at not only my work, but the work of the practitioners who have raised me, people like Audrey Zina Mandiela, people like Janet Sears and Roma Spencer, Ama Harris of Theatre in the Rough, it's, it's allowed me to look at their work and to look at from, from a, from a mental perspective to look at how they metabolize trauma through mm -hmm. performance, how they experience emancipation and liberation through the act of performing and how they create institutions that then mentor other people like me. Then I'm looking at the, the, the practitioners who I have mentored and my contemporaries um, and, and then I'm looking at my own work. And so the, the idea is to create this monograph that, that, that doesn't yet exist of Black women's theater in Canada and, and to chart its impact on the Canadian theatrical landscape and to, and to produce a monograph that, that then can be used in theater schools by theater companies, by anyone interested in, in Black women's work, and also by, by us, a, an archive, a document where we can see in, in, in clear terms what our practice, practices are, what our theater making practices are. I'm in the last year now, so I'm, I'm in the right up stage now. And so, congratulations. Thank you. Like, even this conversation, like being able to, have this conversation to, 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 to articulate 
what it is that this sacred research is becoming is really quite it's it, it's so it's it's i appreciate it because it's so urgent and crucial to have to have the space to be able to 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 dialogue yeah mm. thank you thank you um oh i well there are lots of comments uh, a lot of love is being shared <laughs> in the chat um let me just oops uh okay just making sure <laughs> i'm still getting used to um to 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 instagram i just i feel like maybe this okay oh i was just sorry i just wanted to make sure that everybody can see your beautiful face um so you're such a brilliant artist there there there's so much you said, and I'm so glad this is a space where you're able to, you know, metabolize. I think that's also what you're doing is like metabolizing your work. Um, somebody says, Debi, I love you. I'm so excited about your work. Um, the blur blurdy one is, am I saying correctly? <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Um, greetings, beautiful one, says Empress. Impress Lisa. Thank you. But thanks for joining in on this magical conversation. I think I tell you again, sis, it's such a it's such a beautiful idea and platform to have conversations with each other, you know, like why aren't we having conversations? Mm -hmm. It reminds me like sitting at the storytelling tree and just sharing the stories. This is this is how we've survived and, and thrived you know, throughout everything that we've experienced. And, and, and this is how we celebrate what's come before, what's here now, and what's coming in the future. You know, so I'm really, I can't say enough how magical this is. I want to I wanna show you and the Global Village where, where I'm having this conversation because it's giving me pure life, pure life right now. <laughs> Ooh. I hope I moved it slow enough so you can. <laughs> yes, thank you. And so many hearts are going out to you. Um, someone is also saying we really need to hold space for each other and wishing there were more spaces like these. Um, yeah, and, and hopefully we can, I mean, I, I hope that I'm also encouraging people to continue to create these spaces because I have noticed that, I mean, um, uh, Aisha is another dance artist who had started conversations with other dancers um, during the, the the lockdowns, particularly. And so, yeah, so, you know, and that also, like, influenced the idea, as well as um, my work with Camille influenced this idea. So I do hope that this just continues. And, um, yeah, you said, you said so much. And even as you speak and I wanted to acknowledge that like as you speak I feel like the vibrations of your voice and of the words you are speaking to us is healing thank you, thank you. I'll tell you a little secret when I was growing up so my mom is one of the the pioneer dub poets and uh, <laughs> early you know every time I say that she's like why you gotta tell people that <laughs> I'm sorry mom I tell people because I'm so proud mm -hmm. so proud yeah because I'm like you know mom at that age how how did you have the vision to know that spending time with me teaching me how to think critically was important how did you know that under 20 mm -hmm. years old how and she's like well i grew up watching my mother work work so hard in a system in jamaica that really did not 
honor her as a working class black woman and she worked so hard for five children and and the way that my grandmother my mom's telling me this embodied her 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 commitment to her independence her commitment to her her own liberation and emancipation as envisioned by her and the way that she then instilled that in her daughters my grandmother was a domestic laborer she worked in the you know she she worked cleaning other people's homes bringing good hygiene and positive energy to their space like that work is crucial work when somebody comes in and cleans your home and 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 makes your home safe for you hygienically energetically and and beautifies your home that is sacred work that work now i'm 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 hoping that folks are getting paid in a balanced way for that work. That, that's mm. the work my grandmother did. And my mom t would tell me she grew up watching her mom and her mom teaching her about dignity and integrity and, and self-love and self-care. Even growing up, the care and attention that was paid to the body and taking care of the, the, the clothes, however many we had, taking care of it. And, and, and just this relationship with the self that I grew up with as a, as a working class girl in Jamaica that my mom taught me, that her mom taught her, that my aunties taught me. And that those lessons, you know, we have different languages for them today, but we have them deep, deep within our bodies. So one of the things my mom did growing up was she she would spend time with me after school teaching me both languages, teaching me Jamaica Nation language. And she would teach me that by her being on stage, speaking in the nation language, me being invited into the space with the elder practitioners who were speaking nation language, who were, who were reciting writing poems that challenged the, 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 the racial hierarchy of English, that challenged the white supremacy of the English language. And then simultaneously, my mom was teaching me English and teaching me diction and teaching me how to use the English language as a tool for my own emancipation and liberation. My mom at that age knew that that my relationship to both my languages both my my first languages my my earth language my mother language which is jamaican language that that language that that whose umbilical cord connects me back to africa that that i have roots in africa even though diasporized that 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 language is the the, the, the root system, and then simultaneously teaching me the colonizer's language, understanding the dynamics of power that I would have to wrestle with and, 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 and giving me the tools to critically think in both my nation language and the, the colonizer's language so that I could charge are a path of emancipation and liberation. This is what this is what our four people have done. This is what they've done. This is what they've done to us. You know, and so this vibration that you talk about embodying vibration even as we speak the colonizers language bringing our African spiritual vibrations and grounding to that language by changing our rhythmic relationship to the language. Because that's what it is. It's rhythm. It's mm -hmm. rhythm. It's rhythm. That we can shift our rhythmic relationship to the colonizer's language so that we imbue it with power and energy and make it our own vibrationally rhythmically and this is something that definitely my mother taught me in in dub poetry that is what we're doing 
dub poetry is that form of poetry, performance poetry that, of course, grows out of the African storytelling tree. Let's not get it twisted. Dub poetry is a performance storytelling form that comes out of African storytelling forms that were brought in the bodies of enslaved African peoples to Jamaica. And we see this phenomenon all over the world when we look at how Black peoples globally embody storytelling. We see that clearly there is some genetic thing going on. <laughs> right? Like, come on now. Right? Dub is just one of those, one of the shoots, one of the branches, one of the outgrowths of the African storytelling tradition that has within it rhythm. Rhythm is one of the principles of dub poetry. My mom wrote her thesis in, in, in at J Jamaica School of Drama, it was called at the time, it's now called the Edna Manley College for the Visual and Performing Arts. She wrote her thesis on dub poetry and she identified four elements of dub. Rhythm is one of those elements. The other ones are language, politics, and performance and rhythm, music. And so the rhythm of our language, the rhythm of our voice, the rhythm of our bodies carries with the spirit of our homeland, our original homeland, which is Africa. It's Africa. That is powerful. Thank you also for mentioning the 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 mothers the foremothers the women who have um guided you mentored you who've taught you who've embodied freedom as you said liberation and um i also want to say hello i think my aunt is here oh, hi. <laughs> she joined yeah don't he joined um yeah and just like you said so much. Um, someone here, Jose Marja Dredd, says, watching um, pantomime is what made me pursue acting embodiment of storytelling. Same here. Definitely was a part of it. Definitely. Like, magic. Pantomime was magic growing up. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the... the I... I it, the spirit moves through me when I think of growing up in Jamaica because, because of the impact of colonization on Jamaican society and I mean on so many, so many communities globally, everything exists there and, 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 and as do extremes, you know, so the magic of pantomime and storytelling and storytelling being embodied in every aspect of the society and also the ways in which we are we are made to to survive you know that mimics the violence that we experience and after the transatlantic enslavementocracy that violence that that makes its way into our bodies and into our families, into our homes, into our communities. The ways in which the disruption, like the, 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 the aggressive, violent, heinous disruption that colonialism meted out on our communities and the ways our bodies remember that trauma and then play that trauma out. So I th thinking about growing up, everything was present, the deep joy, deep an expansive joy, the deep and expansive dynamism, the laughter, and also the like, the sadness and the tragedies and the, the deaths and all of that mixed in together. Really, for me, uh, when I when I look at where I am now, that is the texture of my life. And I am thankful. I am mm. grateful. I'm grateful to be here being able to reflect and introspect. I'm grateful to have been raised by a community that did everything that it, it could so that I could survive and thrive. 
I'm grateful to have those experiences that inform my passion and my empathy. And, and I'm grateful that all of those lessons, all of those teachings, those experiences culminates. And by culminates, I don't mean ends, right? Because everything is continuing. But definitely, there's a culmination in this system that I've been working on for the last few years, the Anita Africa method. Without those experiences, the, those dynamic, complex, layered, painful magical, expansive, joyful, celebratory, without that legacy, that African black experiential legacy that 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 I wouldn't I wouldn't be here in this way. And I, I and I wouldn't be able to work on a method like the Anita Africa method in this way. So so I feel like gratitude gratitude and a deep understanding that life lives life lives mm. what 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 the world has produced before you and i got here is some serious life lifing human beings make choices making choices making choices that has resulted in where we are now this is where we are now i am grateful for where i am now because the method, those systems that inform the method, the intersectionality systems and theories and, 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 and ideas that have been created by other practitioners before me, Kimberly Crenshaw, Comb Tree Collective, Bell Hooks, Patricia Collins, all the revolutionaries, Walter Rodney, Malcolm X, all the revolutionaries coming out of IT, all the revolutionaries coming out of Jamaica, all over the Caribbean, all the revolutionaries coming out of South America, the global South, all the revolutionaries coming out of the African continent, coming out of Europe, coming. I mean, it is a global and has been a global revolutionary struggle. All the indigenous people who've always resisted imperialism and colonization. I am grateful for where I am now because without all of that, without all of that, I wouldn't be here and have the opportunity to, 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 to contribute my own interventions in this ongoing project of decolonizing, of healing, of, of transforming you know, and it's a, it's a choice to look back and look back from that perspective, even while I grieve, I grieve the violence and I grieve the, 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 the atrocities that are continue to happen right now, the murders that are continuing to happen, the, 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 the impoverishing of entire global peoples that are continuing to happen, the, the deepening inequities that are continuing all of that is all of that makes me mourn and grieve and i mourn and grieve i mourn and i grieve and i and i allow my anger i allow my anger to be felt in my body mm. because i know that all of those things are a part of this experience of being human and i actualize and activate because I can't just sit with grieving and mourning and being angry. I also have to activate and actualize and use my mind and use my body, use my spirit, use my hope to intervene in my own life first and then to intervene in whatever ways I can in the lives of my community. And the method, the Anita Africa method, is one such intervention. The poetry is another intervention. The theater is another intervention. And trying to be a human being with integrity is another intervention. These are all mm -hmm. interventions to help me to navigate what it means to be human on a planet that 
has experienced tremendous amounts of of trauma and continue to mm -hmm. yeah that, that's some serious preaching actually earlier in in her in her voice in in her voice in black mentioned preach like this is some medicine you're giving us thank you so much some real real medicine um and it makes me think of because i i experienced your program or at least a part of it because really when i hear you speak i i see the connections from your mother from you know your grandmother i also see yeah just how these principles are are so i don't want to say ordinary but it's like it's part of our everyday but they're they're so fundamental in a way that is almost yeah. difficult to grasp yeah and so the work you're doing in the phd at, or even in your lived experiences is phenomenal and yeah and and i f okay so i have sort of many many questions because i'm thinking so was there even a catalyst or a point where you knew you had to do this work and then i almost feel like the D ubuntu decolonial art center almost has always existed <laughs> even though i know that you know in 2020 you started talking about wanting to put this into existence but as you speak i'm thinking but this has always existed it, it's almost like it was always there and you put it into physical form now in costa rica <laughs> same way i feel the same way you know i i am a product of social conditioning you know and so many of us are so I think for me, it's like what social conditioning um, took the lead. Mm -hmm. And the social conditioning that took the lead is a social conditioning grounded in decolonizing ourselves. Like in Jamaica, growing up, there was an ongoing project of decolonizing the self. And, it, and it's a grassroots-led project, a popular education project. You know, people actively in Jamaica, people like the Poets in Unity, graduates of Jamaica School of Drama, these, there, is, there, there was and continues to be a Pan-African philosophical framework that is at work, not only in the Caribbean, but globally. You know, I don't hear the word Pan-Africanism so much in the circles in which I move nowadays. But I understand that this Pan-Africanist ethos grounded the social conditioning that I experienced growing up. Hmm. It did. It did. So Garveyism... Rastafarianism, the conversation between Garveyism and Rastafarianism, the conversation between Garveyism and the civil rights movement in America, the conversation between Garveyism, the civil rights movement in America, and the Mau Maus on the continent, the conversation between all those spaces and the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. So and added to that, the, 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 the South American revolutionary movements, uh, these conversations were happening together, as in these spaces were talking to each other and continue to do so. When I was growing up, like a fly on the wall, like a kid on somebody's hip, in somebody's arms at these meetings, that were that connected the pan-africanist movement the global anti-colonial movement with the caribbean north america europe specifically the uk as well the continent and south america that this global pan-africanist conversation was happening um not that everybody agreed with each other on everything 
but the important thing is that the conversation is happening. So that Pan-Africanist movement that heavily informed by African knowledge systems, like the, the, the system of Ubuntu, like the system of Sankofa, like the sage knowledge system, these epistemological frameworks, and I say epistemological because white supremacy also has its own epistemology. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, so there was an awareness that there's a difference between working within a white a white supremacist epistemological framework. Right? We're talking about approaches to logical thinking, you know, approaches science, to science as is, separate. <laughs> right? These we we can work within a european supremacist a white supremacist epistemological framework or work within indigenous knowledge systems and what i'm saying is that these pan africanist spaces were very much aware of working within indigenous knowledge systems and not trying to recreate um white supremacist knowledge systems in blackface that so there's there's a very big difference there so that's that's that is the root that informs my approach now so the method ubuntu decolonial art center the, we opened up with looking at these three main areas of intersectionality decoloniality and trauma informed these perspectives are informed by those pan-africanist groundings because sometimes you know when we are having a conversation with academia and we're using certain languages it can quickly become aspiring to be in masa's house because one is as good as masa I just want to be very clear here. Deep thinking, <laughs> critical thinking is a part of our African mm. knowledge systems. Okay. I just, <laughs> let's just, let's be clear. <laughs> Criticality. <laughs> Criticality is our birthright, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Right, and within these, within our our Sankofa systems, our Ubuntu systems, our Sage systems, are different approaches to criticality that are rooted in "I am because you are," as opposed to "I think, therefore I am." <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I am because you are. I am because we are mm -hmm. the collective that forms the foundation. So intersectionality immediately makes sense because it's about looking at everybody mm -hmm. and located. Mm -hmm. Decolonizing makes sense because it's about looking at the dynamics of power that we're navigating right now. Mm -hmm trauma form makes sense because it's acknowledging the, the the pain that we continue to experience and all of that is ubuntu all, mm -hmm. all of that is already buried in ubuntu the philosophy of, of ubuntu is an umbrella for this language <laughs> and ubuntu is an ancient system that exists all over the continent so mm -hmm. clear, let's be clear that we're accessing what is already our birthright with this increased criticality that includes looking at the ways in which colonialism has forced homophobia down our throats and has forced misogyny and patriarchy down our throats and telling us all kinds of narratives about what existed and what didn't exist. 
let us learn. Let us learn about who we are and who we've been. Let us learn. Mm-hmm. Let us learn. Let us reclaim our criticality. Let us reclaim our Ubuntu that makes space for everyone to exist. Understanding that this is a symbiotic relationship with the planet. Let us reclaim mm-hmm. our Ubuntu that generosity and kindness has to be the foundation of any exchange system as opposed to capitalism which will suck out the matter out of your eye till you're, <laughs> till you're dead dry up, dry up yes. dead. right let us reclaim these indigenous knowledge systems that has room for all of what seems to be intellectualisms of today that seems to be these identities that everybody is, you know, the, the multiple pronouns and all of this seems to be of today. But let's actually learn and realize that all that exists existed before. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How could we possibly think that all that is existing now didn't exist before? Mm-hmm. Like, that just mind. blows my mind. Mm-hmm. Blows my mind. Reciprocity and kindness. I love that. I love it. Because as you said, something something um just reminded me how even having the right language and I say right language in quotations is something that people have learned to master without embodying that reciprocity and kindness and then when that is lacking the result is not the same yeah. it, right it's not the same and and i'm thinking i almost want to say you know if s- some people on the call have not experienced um you know listening to you every day in a program or being in your presence um i would strongly strongly encourage you know visiting or getting involved in the ubuntu uh, decolonial art center can you tell us can you tell us okay first of all like how could we get there <laughs> you know how can we be in that sort of <laughs> how can you get here <laughs> say complain <laughs> <laughs> yes for sure um the center the the center you're right you know the center has existed for a very long time because for the last 20 years i have hosted and have been hosting constant international artist residencies around the world with the hope and dream and desire to eventually have a place that is consistent for artists to come to and by the grace of the ancestors and the grace of the global community and the grace of, of hard work on my part, we now have that space and that is this space, right? Mm. On the mountain, overlooking the sea. I don't know if you can see the sea right over there, over the treetops, but that's the sea over there. And we officially opened the center in December, uh, but we actually have been here um, since last summer running residencies. So, but now it's officially open. So, the Ubuntu is the name of the center for all the reasons we've been talking about. Gr- grounding in this principle that I am because you and we are together. Ultimately, everything that we do at the center is to ground in that belief system and in that actualization. And so I encourage you all to check out decolonialartcenter.com. Center, T-R-E, not (laughs) T-E-R. Decolonialartcenter.com. It's really quite an expansive website. Um, We've done, you know, we keep editing and adding so that you have all the information that you need, including a frequently asked question section and a frequently Mm -hmm. used 
term section because you know as we as we engage in this language it's really important that the language is accessible you know it's not it, for me it's not it's not responsible to be using language that's inaccessible and then not to be defining that language so that we can all participate um some of the language that I am using currently, I'm using because one word can encapsulate a lot of meaning. And so I, I like to use that language and then define that language so that we can continue the conversation. Mm -hmm. So we've got frequently used term section that was really important for us to put on there so that the global village knows that this is not about any kind of exclusivity but rather we are, again, taking back our birthright um, of criticality. That's what we're doing. Stepping into the critical thinking, critical being, critical living, and making sure that we can communicate together. So currently, the center has two streams of programming. One stream of programming are a series of online interventions that are all grounded in decolonizing. So we've got a decolonial intensive for Black women and non-binary folks. We've got a decolonial intensive for global majority artists. So that's Black, Indigenous, all genders, all peoples who identify as global majority artists. And we've got a decolonial intensive for people who identify as white practitioners. And the reason we are approaching this first set of interventions in this way is to give Black women and non-binary folks a space where we can do this work from an internal experience exclusive perspective where we can do this self-transformation and healing work knowing that the bodies in the room are black women identifying and non-binary black non-binary identifying so we can have a part a specific conversation with creating a space for global majority artists we also wanted to make room for practitioners who want to be in the room with other folks, Black, Indigenous, other folks of color, other on all genders. So sometimes the work that we're doing, we know that we can grow from being in the room with everyone. But that room is not a room with white practitioners because we also wanted to create a space where global majority practitioners can have that decolonial conversation and do that work without having a white gate. Mm -hmm. And then the, the third uh, decolonial intensive is for white practitioners. Again, creating a space for white practitioners who are already engaged in decolonial work who, or who are interested in beginning decolonial work on themselves and in the art that they make or in the institutions that they lead, knowing that if we're going to change this world, that continuing the project of change that was started by our ancestors, if we're going to continue that work, we've got to understand that that work is for everyone to do. And so we've got the decolonial intensive for white practitioners who want to be in the space with other white practitioners having that conversation about how we're going to decolonize ourselves and how we're going to decolonize, do decolonial work as allies, etc. So this is the first series of intensives that are online, again, with the intention that as the work develops, we're going to create spaces where other where we're mixed in together so that we can have a conversation across race, across genders, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, but in our time, we're going to be begin with these courses now. We also have another course in the summertime that's specifically for Black practitioners who want to understand how to create their own decolonial frameworks. So as an educator, what I've been taught by my elders 
And what they've given me is the tools to then do the work for myself. And so I think it's important that, 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 that I'm also doing that work. So giving people the tools, using the Anita Africa method for them to create their own methodologies, for them to create mm. their own systems. Because black practitioners are like, again, acknowledging that we are always creating systems and methods, but not necessarily documenting them, archiving them, or naming them as such. And so the Decolonial Frameworks program in the summer is a program that will pay six black practitioners to pay them a thousand dollars for six weeks online to develop their own method and will teach shepherd them in that process facilitate that process using the anu africa method then we got a series wow. of in-person residencies now this is where the practitioners come to live in a beautiful um cottage on the land and work on developing a new piece of work or work their own self-transformation or work on decolonizing. There, there are many different residencies. Uh, on the website, we've got a list of grants because I highly encourage practitioners to apply for grants, being out of pocket, and we support the practitioner's grant application process. Everything that I'm sharing with you, Em, is on the website, mm. including a 26-minute video explaining all of this because I, I i you know practitioners were contacting me asking how they could um get involved and so i thought i'm gonna make a video post it mm -hmm. on the site so that you can watch that video it's essentially me talking about these um interventions that are on the website and then once you go through when you have further questions then you can contact the center directly and we'll then engage with you one on one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That's that's it. That's really great, and I love. I mean, I think most residencies, art residencies, are paid, but it's just the way you presented it. It was like, yes, paid art residencies with grant application process. That sounds great. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And so I know we've come to a momentary end of our time together. Is there anything else you'd like to share, say, um, add? To say that um, I want to reiterate again that I really appreciate this space and opportunity to share with you. It's, um, I haven't done it in a, uh, conversation in a while because I, I went into silence after the kink uh, in December and then I've just been in conceptualizing mode up until now and so it really feels <sighs> exciting and grounding on April 1st to be in this room with you <laughs> thank you thank you for the launching this the next period and uh to the global village i welcome you to the center you know this project is a project of the heart and soul and mind and spirit and of our our incredible legacy of survival and thrival and so i welcome you to the center we we are designing many ways that you can participate many 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 ways the website is decolonialartscenter.com. That's decolonialartscenter.com. So arts has an S, yes. And then center is T-R-E. Um, but you can also find it if you just Googled Ubuntu Center online, it'll pop up. If you Google me online, it'll pop up. It's like it's got a lot of uh, internet presence um and then like i said we've got online courses they all they have subsidies and payment plans again so that everyone can participate we've got in-person residencies that have scholarships as well 
where you get like a 70% reduction on the cost if you're unable to get a grant. So there are so many ways to participate. And, and short of all of that, uh, we can have a conver conversation about um, what you have in mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing us under your tree. <laughs> Thank you for sharing the stories. You know, I bobo ashe. <laughs> yeah, this was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much again for joining us on Compete Hour. And I hope that we'll see each other actually in person soon. I'm so interested in this, this center and your projects. And yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Global Village. Bye, Em. Thank you. Bye. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Take good care. Bye. <laughs>